Welcome to the Cold Blooded Truth. Ooh, ooh, cold blooded. That's cold. Yo, 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 what is the deal? Shout out to the grateful ones at the crib watching. Tune in. I appreciate y'all. This is another segment of the Cold Blooded Truth podcast. Got a very special guest in the building. We live at IM Studios right now in Pittsburgh alongside number 1073 FM radio station. Uh, this guest, I've seen kill it on the south side doing this thing. Uh, some, somehow, apparently, I'm just finding out making a, a comeback, if you will, into his own career in the DJ scene, uh, shutting the clubs down, promoting himself. This guy is real into branding. Uh, he's a real inspiration to me when it comes to branding, marketing, and really pushing your own content when it comes to your own creative practices. Uh, this person has a lot of good things in the works, some things that people may not know about uh, outside of the DJ scene, but uh, none other. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, DJ Tweak. Oh man, thanks for having me, bro. Thank you for pulling up. How you feeling today? Oh, I'm feeling awesome, man. Blessed. Feeling good? Same old, same old? Same old, same old, man. Loving it. Okay, so what? Uh, just, just to kick things off, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, you too. How, how do you feel going into the New Year? We're almost a weekend, you know, any New Year's resolutions you're sticking to? Any goals, anything? Our first quarter, uh, you know, just keep doing what I'm doing. You know, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to use 2022 to grow even more. Uh, you know, just uh, 2021 was awesome for me. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, uh, I grew quite a bit. I came back uh, to the DJ game in about around February. So now, you know, my goal is to take the full year in advantage and you know, use the whole entire year in my advantage and try to grow. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll we'll touch on that. Yeah, but to dial back a little bit, uh, where where did this start for you? Like, when did you? think, yeah, I want to start doing this DJ thing? Honestly, I was like 12 years old, and, uh, you know, I used to, like, you know, watch the OGs, you know what I mean, back in the day, just doing it, and I was like, holy oh, shit. Oh, OGs know. like who? Uh, Jazzy Jeff, Q-Bert, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, just the old scratch DJs. I just always was into music, like, music was my passion, so, like, just seeing it, just seeing them mix and do cuts and, you know, get creative, it was just fucking awesome for me, so I was like, <laughs> you know, I want to do it. And, uh, you know, when I was, I was I was really young at the time, I think I was like in eighth grade, and I told my parents, I was like, you know, I'm trying to get into it, whatever. And, like, one of the biggest things my mom always told me is, like, you know, always have a good hobby, you know, it's going to it's gonna help you grow or, right. like, you know, keep you busy or whatnot. And, uh, you know, I just got, like, my first DJ set up, and I just started learning, learning. Back then, you didn't have YouTube, so, like, you know. Right. What, what, what year is this, by the way? Um, so, I, was a, I would say, like, 2001. Okay. 2001, yeah. Right. So, awesome. so, so 2001, uh, hardware and equipment has definitely changed a lot since then. Oh, hell yeah. What, like, do you remember your first board or CDJs or was it? Yeah, I actually didn't CDs? have CDJs. They were, I, I mean, they had CDJs, but they weren't like popular. They didn't do right. much. So I actually, uh, I actually started off right. I wanted like the right setup. I, uh, I got a set of techniques. I got okay. 1200s, and I think my first mixer was either Vestax. Mm. Or an old, old, old pioneer. But I mean, it was just like perfect for exactly what I needed to. Mm -hmm. I just kind of wanted to, like, you know, learn the skill or just, you know, try to replicate what these other DJs were doing. So I would just, mm -hmm. like, watch little clips and just keep trying to do the same thing over, sometimes for like a week at a time, just to, like, right. learn certain things. Yeah. So it was awesome. So was this, uh, this before Serato, right? Way I, before I, Serato. I, yeah, I don't know how new Serato is, but I know, like, Man. as far as programs go, like, using computer. Way before Serato. Like, I remember. So, like, even when I was in high school, so, like, I started actually DJing clubs at 17. Really? But, like, yeah, so I was still in high school, but, uh, like, even, like, before that, so I used to do, like, you know, the homecoming dances mm -hmm, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Bro, I would have crates, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, you yeah. have to carry fucking yeah. crates. Like, now you have your laptop, it's mm -hmm. created, you can have hundreds of thousands of songs. Back then, mm -hmm. you didn't have that. And then, at one point, I did switch to CDJs, and that was around, like, maybe I would say 2003, 2004, just because it got... That's not too far easy. away. That's from, far, man. From, from 01 to 04? Yeah, I mean, but then, but I mean, they, they started becoming popular because, like, everybody started having, like, a CD burn. Like, a lot of the right, you know, right, young kids right. these days don't understand. Like, right, they used to right. have to go download music, wait three days for one song to download, and then you put it on a CD, and you got to label it, and then you had, like, a little CD album. Like, yeah, it was way before Serato. So, like, a lot of DJs these days, they don't, they can't understand like how much harder it was for you to be a DJ today you just download a song off of whatever yeah. like you know off of a record pool you play while you're live in the club yeah back then we had 56k man it took like three days to download a song <laughs> <laughs> you know it was, it was it was crazy but I I appreciate that experience because honestly it helped me just you know learn the process right and learn to do things better mm -hmm. you know I can beat match by ear mm -hmm. I don't need Serato so you know like mm -hmm. 
Sometimes even like when I'm in a club right now, you see mm-hmm. DJs. I don't need to run. I'll just put my USB, put my tracks in there, do what I gotta do, and just bounce. You know, I mean, it's it's it's, mm-hmm. it's nice to have that because a lot of DJs, if it's not for a controller or a sync button, they can't mm-hmm. even do it. And I still yeah. respect somebody's hustle. Like, yeah. you know, what I mean, if, even if you're a DJ, don't know how to use a router, or don't know how to beat match or whatever, you know, still do your thing. You know, learn if you want to use a sync button, use a sync button. You know, I don't have to, but if that's the, if that's your way of learning, I I never hang around about scrap. I feel like you know, mm-hmm. technology's there for a reason to make everything easy. So, mm-hmm. so I'm I, I've used turntables very briefly before, mm-hmm. but for those of you watching, this, this is this is to my knowledge. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Technics or the old setup you see, right? You have the vinyl records that have a whole bunch of grooves in it, which give off a certain vibration. That's how you get audio and music and songs, right? That's the old school way. Yep. So the Technics run. There's a motor in it. Mm-hmm. It rotates the platters clockwise. You have the arms and the needles that you can move to different parts of the record depending on what time you want to start or stop the song and cut and all of that stuff. Oh well, yeah, we used to have to put a piece of tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to get the labels on. Yeah. yeah, like back in the day, you have to put a mm-hmm. piece of tape and it still wasn't perfect. You have to Same thing on tires too. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like if you ever get tires, you'll, if you get brand new tires, you might see a little sticker near your uh, like where your valve stem is at, yeah. or where your bead is supposed to be. Oh yeah. We know some things over here. <laughs> uh, so beat matching. Yeah. What is that? For those who so you know, different songs have different tempos. You know, when they're mm-hmm. produced or recorded, they're, they're they're recorded at different tempos. So for example, if you have a song that's a hundred beats per minute, and you got another song that's ninety four beats per minute, you can still mix them. Yeah. But. Unless you cold drop, you can't actually mix on top of each other until you get a matching BPM. Generally, a lot of people they try to meet in the middle. I just always meet at the top song because you know I'm, I'm not. So you even, just bring the slower one up to speed. Yeah, I just bring. It just sounds better, in my okay. opinion. Yeah, I mean, because like the other one, uh, you know, the faster song slow it down just sounds weird. A lot of people mm-hmm. like even if you bring it down two BPMs, you can tell. I just I just always like to play stuff a little bit faster, especially if you're in a club or whatnot. Mm-hmm. The vibe is just so much better. A lot of times, people, you know, like even in the midst of drinking and partying and all of that, but let's say they weren't and they're literally sitting there listening, they might not even hear it. But yeah, we'll, I, but we'll hear it. Oh, we'll hear it, hundred percent. Like, uh, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I'm not fucking perfect. I'll fuck. Like, I like to quick mix. So, like, <laughs> my thing is, like, I'll be in the club, in a night, I'll probably drop four hundred songs. Like, it's it's yeah. not something where I play full songs. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, of sometimes, course. sometimes it's bound to happen where you're gonna fuck up. A lot of people don't notice. Like, you just keep doing their thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know me? I'm like, fuck, like, you know what I mean? But I, you know, I just try to recover from it quick. But it's uh, you know, it's uh, it's a fun craft. You know, you can't. You can't like you know get, be hard on yourself for fucking up every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Not, no, nobody's a perfect DJ. I mean, I've seen some of the most epic DJs out there have DJ fails, so it is what it is. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's fun. It's nice to watch, and it makes you better. I mean, it makes you focus the next time. To make sure you don't repeat that same mistake. What area did you grow up in? So, I was actually born in another country. I was I'm, I'm actually Syrian, so I was born this, in Syria. Yeah, and I'm not gonna lie, you always look. I'm not gonna say strange, but just different. Yeah, yeah. I got uh, I went to school with another uh, Syrian Syrian dude. Uh, his name is Mark. He makes beats and stuff like that. He's like the first person I ever met oh, from really? Syria. Yeah, 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 man. I mean, I moved here when I was eight. You know, we used to go back in the summers. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, Syria's in the Middle East, but a lot of people think like the Middle East is a desert, or whatnot, bro. Like we have no. to, we're on the Mediterranean, nicest beaches ever. Yeah. The nightlife, literally in Syria. Like we also have a house in Lebanon. It's like house in, uh, you know. But Syria. you still go back. Oh yeah, yeah, we go back. You know, mm-hmm. so like Syria and Lebanon, man. Like the beaches, stuff, even the nightlife. Like it puts Vegas to shame. Like there's some clubs in Lebanon, you know, actually um, recently found out, like, uh, Wiz Khalifa performed at one of them, and it's mm. just, you know, you got rooftop clubs that fit 5,000 people, pyrotechnics, like, all sorts of crazy shit, like, over That's a different kind of money over there. Beach. Yeah, I mean, it's dope, I mean, it's just, you know, it's cool, because, like, I get to experience it, like, I love it, you know, I get mm-hmm. to go back, I get to see it, but, like, a so lot still of people weren't informed. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, still got family, we still got our houses, like I said, like, you know, got a house in Syria, got a house in Lebanon, it's pretty dope. But yeah, we moved to the States when I was eight years old. I actually didn't even speak it like English. I was going to ask you uh, that. What, what, the, what do you speak over? Do you speak Syrian? I don't know if that's... Yeah, it's, uh, it's a Syrian dialect of Arabic, actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, when, uh, when we moved there, bro, I'll never forget I didn't speak a lick of English. But because I was so young, literally it only took like six months. I was fluent with no accent in six months. In six months? In six months. Because I went to school not knowing a word. Like, uh, I, I remember I moved here. Um, I was going into fourth grade. I was eight years old. Because over there... Uh, you can skip kindergarten if you want to and just go right into first grade. So that's exactly what I did. And so okay. I started school when I was uh, four years old. So when I was when I came here and I was eight, I had just turned eight in March, and then I went right into fourth grade. I just, 
I'll never forget, I did not speak English. I would do like half a day normal classes, and mm -hmm. then the other half they had like a teacher who only speech. spoke English. Yeah. yeah, like try to like, you know, like they had, I'll never forget, they had like these books with pictures and everything, and you know, just play around. Like it was, it was very creative and very fun, and within like six months, I'll never forget it, like my second half of fourth grade, fluid, no issues, no accent. Like people didn't even know I was from another country. Imagine like within <laughs> six months, it was weird. Yeah, but it's cool, like it's uh, it's a great experience. You know, I love being bilingual too, it's kind of, it's kind of cool. And also it gives you creativity with music. Like I like to produce sometimes, so, like there's certain sounds, certain ideas you can capture from all that stuff because you're just a little bit more informed. So we come to America and you learn how to speak English in six months at eight years old. Yeah. What did you, how did you feel in that moment? Like did you feel discouraged looking at pictures of like fruit and animals and stuff and trying to figure out what words mean what or were no. you like just honestly it's not really like you're just so young like you know when you're eight years old like right now you did know, you did you understand what was happening like did you understand you were moving to a whole new country oh no no like, yeah, did yeah, you yeah. know I mean, what america like, was yeah, yeah yeah i mean my uh my grandparents been here since like the 70s so it's not okay. like anything crazy you know it's just yeah. we just decided to make the move at that point but you know when you're here i just feel like when you're eight, when you're eight years old like you're still in the learning stage of everything you're still getting introduced to new stuff all the time so i didn't like in my head i don't i mean i don't remember obviously i was eight years old but i never thought like Oh my God! What is this? Like I just thought right. it's just a new thing I'm learning, and you know it just didn't take long. Like uh, you know, the school helped out. Like I said, you know they hired a, a teacher to kind of help me, and at the same time, actually, my cousins, like two of my cousins, moved here at the same time. So we were all in the same school. We were all a couple years apart, mm -hmm. so we would all do these classes together. So it was kind of cool. Like I wasn't like alone. You yeah. know what I mean? It was. Uh, I don't know. It was fun. Like looking back, I'll never forget that teacher. I actually see her randomly every once in a while. So it's you like, better to club. Uh, she's a little bit older. I don't think she's going to What does that mean? Uh, no, nah, no. Nah. I mean, we've seen old heads in a club before. Well, no, I mean, yeah, there's old heads. I just don't see her as the club type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, yeah, no, I mean, school, I mean, I just, I don't, I don't think I was discouraged in any way. I just thought it was something new to learn. It was pretty cool. Hmm. Yeah. So, off camera, uh, during, during the break, uh, you mentioned that you have a son. I do, yeah. What, what, can you talk about fatherhood? Like, what was it like when you found out you were about to be a dad? What was uh, it like it now? Was, it was amazing. I love kids, so I've always wanted to have my own kid. Uh, so my son's five. His name is Madden. Mm -hmm. And yes, I did name him after the video game. That's <laughs> so, hard. Rest in peace to John, man. <laughs> well, his mom, like, you know, like, my last name is Mansoor. So, mm -hmm. like, his mom wanted, like, the two initials to match. You know what I mean? So she was giving me all sorts of crazy names. I'm like, fuck out of here. I'm not naming Like, you, you know, you know, like, they have all these modern names. They're just weird as fuck. I was like, no. And I was like, we might as well name him Madden, because I was playing Madden. She goes, oh, I actually like that. I was like, oh, hell, don't even say that. She's like, yes, yeah. so we just named him Madden, man. I'm all, you know, it's, 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 it's awesome. He loves his name. So, like, anytime he goes and sees the game, I was like, dad, that's named after me, right? I'm like, no, nah, man, you're named after me. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, so, what, uh, for, for those, can you give some advice for new parents, for those who might be about to have their first child or they're thinking about it? Man, yeah, I mean, it's the best thing on earth, honestly. Uh, so, you know, I'm actually divorced. So, okay. I don't know that. So, my son actually lives in Philly with his mom. I get him for one week out of a month, and I get him all summers. What, what's, what's it like dealing with that? Uh, you know, it's it's hard. You know, I miss the hell out of him. But, like, we're best friends. Like, uh, you know, we FaceTime every single night. You know, mm -hmm. we talk. So, you know, one of the biggest things with kids, is, you know, that I notice is they just want to know they're loved. You know what I'm saying? So, like, right. Absolutely. keep the attention, you know, show them like you care. You know, I talk to them all the time, you know, like, dude, who's my best friend? Like, me and who's mine? You, you know what I mean? Like, we keep yeah. that. And then, you know, when they're here, just do fun stuff, man. Kids don't want anything crazy. You know, they just they just want to have a good time, know they're loved, you know. So, it's hard because, like, you know, like, especially after the summer, we spent the whole entire summer together. Mm -hmm. So, like, imagine, you know, going to see your son every day for three months and boom, you know, you're seeing him one week and a month, you know. It's kind of yeah. tough, but... You know, just be a good dad. Just be there for your kid. Uh, he mm -hmm. wrestles now, so, like, I go out there. Uh, you know, I used to wrestle, so I go out there. You know, I go to, his, like, tournaments, mm -hmm. uh, make some practices, you know, be there for him. They love that stuff, you know, hype mm -hmm. them up. So, you know, it's just uh, being being a dad is easy. I just think, you know, you just got to be there. That's all. That's mm -hmm. all it takes. What, what's uh, some tips you could give to other fathers who might be going through, I don't know if you went through, like, the legal system to get that type of arrangement. Yeah, the legal system. Yeah. Dude, the legal system is terrible. Honestly, uh, they're never going to side with you. It's always going to be with the mother. It's a fact. Most dads don't win in court. Like, you don't. You, you just don't win. Yeah, it's not even possible. I mean, it's a time. I mean, I, j I just remember, you know, I'm a businessman, yeah. you know, don't have any kind of record, you know, never been arrested, never had an issue or whatnot. And, you know, just exactly like you said, like no shade to my baby's mom, because now we're we yeah. get along great in the, in the best interest for our son, obviously the co-parent. But mm -hmm. at the time, you know, when you're going through a divorce mm -hmm. and it's bad, 
it's such a negative impact on everything, like on yourself yeah, and at the same time on your kid. That, that, that's, that's a whole other ball game compared to like just ending up having a kid and you guys don't really got like the foundation. You're kind of trying to figure things out versus Facts. you're married and then shit hits the fan and then you have to. Dude, it's hard. Like, it, you know, it literally that's, that's is. A lot. It's just, it, you know, it's, it's unfair. It's 100% unfair because like you'll go in there, you'll pitch your case and you're just listening. You're like, oh shit. Like, Based off what just happened, there's no way I'm going to lose. And then, boom, you know, they're like, well, we picked the mother to have custody. Why? Because you work too much. The mother has more time. Like, what kind of bullshit is that? Like, honestly, like, it just doesn't make sense because if you're really looking out for the best interest of the child, the person who works more and who works harder and can provide better, and I'm not saying that to be disrespectful in any way, shape, or form, but I, I know exactly what I'm a saying. hustler, man. I work. I have yeah. multiple, uh, you know, streams of income. I'm, you yeah. know, most, most of the DJs like. are. We're like that. We're really Fast. busy. That's what I'm saying. But like, I'm always like doing investments, doing crazy stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be able to be the better provider. You know, I'm, I might work a lot, but you know, kids are in school during the day. You know, my parents love my son, so like they're yeah. obsessed with him. He loves them. So like, there's there's a support system there. It's the yeah. same exact way as everywhere else. It just never makes sense. And then you got mm -hmm. the child support that you know. It's not what the child needs. It's basically because it's available. Like, you know, if you make a lot of money, they're like literally just going to go ahead and say, oh, well, we're going to give a big that. chunk. And yeah, and it yeah. doesn't make sense yeah, because I, I know that money isn't going towards him. Not all of it. They're, it's it's yeah. going to her. And, and, even, and it's not even, fair. even if it was going all to your kid, why can't they just entrust in you to start a fund or something for them that's going to accrue Absolutely. whatever the cruise and then the kid gets it when they get older instead of. We're gonna take this from you because hundred percent like, legally we build a trust fund or some shit. You know what yeah. I mean? But like at the same time, you know, like they simply take that amount of money because it's available and not because like, exactly. even 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 the situation you got, you could have still went into that situation and let's say she just got full and you're just it's just you now. Yeah, and no, just I mean, out here. I would never like, that, that happens to, to people. That would never I'm telling you, I would Bro, get fucking nuts. Like, right. that's not gonna happen, you know? Right. Like, nobody's gonna tell me I can't see myself. Right, 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 so. Yeah, but like, exactly. Especially like, I don't do drugs. I'm not, like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a bad person. So like, there's not a chance in hell I'll ever let somebody tell me I can't see myself. But at the same fucking time, like, you know, and this is just out there, like, for other people, you know, just <clears throat> be careful from being trapped. Like, I feel like a lot of, a lot of females trap dudes. And, you know, a lot of females at the same time, you know, they complain, like, Oh, guys are assholes. Guys are assholes. Guys don't want commitment. They just want this. We're not afraid of commitment or marriage. We're afraid of fucking divorce because that shit fucks your whole entire life. I mean, honestly, I'm just telling you, like, from a personal experience, yeah, I, I'll, I, I'll I, never I, be married again, period. And it's not because, be. never. And it's not because I'm afraid of marriage or don't want to be married or don't want to be in a long-term relationship, don't want to settle down. Mm. But that fucking piece of paper, you're literally signing your life away, like half of everything you ever fucking have. And that's fucking bullshit because at the fucking, the, at the same time, I'm out there killing myself, busting my ass to do better, and then they're just giving my shit away like it's nothing just because somebody decided that that's what the fuck they wanted. It's not cool. Like, these men better watch out. Like, that's I see it all the fucking time. Like, guys want money, you know, they think they're about to get some ass. It's cool. Like, dude, that same girl's been with 20 dudes. They only hang out with the dudes that got money. You're going to be trapped, and that's exactly what's going to happen. They just got to be careful. I mean, it hmm. sucks to say, but it's the fucking truth. Like, just be careful. Hmm. Marriage. I would hope to be married someday. I would hope to, you know, have somebody I could like spend the rest of my life with and all that stuff. You know, like I'm the sweet guy that a lot of people don't know. I'm like, I'm, I'm the sweet guy behind closed doors. Uh, now that I'm a piece of shit up front, superficially, but you know what I mean. Uh, so, for people who don't know, what is the, how can I put this? Not criteria. What is the structure of marriage? Like when you say, yo, I want to propose to this woman or guy or girl, whatever your situation is, what is the structure that you are stepping into? I mean, it's a you got to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, for me, I got married at 25. You know what I'm saying? I thought it was the right thing. You know, mm -hmm. I thought I was getting into it with the wrong, uh, with, with, with the right person. My main thing is, I still think marriage is the right thing for me. Mm -hmm. I got into it with the wrong person, but it put an insanely sour taste in my mouth to where I don't want to do it again. And a lot of a lot of people got to understand: do not marry somebody unless you live with them for a while. That's a fact, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, you're, everything changes. And at the same time, if you're not ready to stop going out and stop partying and doing all this crazy shit, mm -hmm. you're not ready for marriage either. You know what I'm saying? My main thing is one of the best things about life, especially in this generation, because we didn't see it as much, like, growing up or whatnot, is, you know, you can still settle down and be with that person for the rest of their life without getting fucking married. Hmm. Or if you get married, do it 10 years down the road. It don't fucking matter. Put a ring on it. 
being engaged, like that piece of paper is what fucks everything up. What, what, what comes with the piece of paper though? Like I, I don't get it. Like the Stress. marriage license thing. I don't get. Like I don't get. Okay. The, but you just this, basically you're legally married in the government's eyes. You know what I'm saying? Which means what? Which means you're fucked if you get a divorce because you're you know you know like you have to go through the fucking legal system. You know what I'm saying? Like the only time you need to go through the legal system if you're not married is if you got a child and you guys cannot come to terms on whatnot. If you're married, everything becomes part of the legal system. Like, for example, you know, if I'm dating somebody for years and we're engaged and, you know, I end up buying a house, I'm doing all the shit, and we break up ten years later because some shit hit the fan, at least I'm not fucked. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If I was married to that person, and, and like I said, look, at the end of the day, if I was the person that fucked up, mm -hmm. it's cool because at that point I deserved it, I made my own fucking bed. But imagine you're out there, you know, you're doing your best, you're building a fucking you know, career, you're building a company, whatever, somebody fucks up and it's not you, and then you lose half of everything without them bringing anything to the fucking table to begin with. That's the fucked up part about our system. Like, why not look at pre-marriage what was on the table? You know what I mean? They don't look at any of that. Or look at pre-marriage and even look like during the marriage was something brought to the table. Something was brought to the table, okay, it's fair, split. Mm -hmm. They don't even look at any of that shit. So mm -hmm. I feel like marriage, especially in this generation, is a fucking agreement. Most people, like when they get married, it's like, all right, let's get married. What do you want to do? All right, well, I'm going to do this. All right, I'm going to do that. All right, let's, let's like, it's not, it's not what it used to be. You know what I'm saying? Social mm -hmm. media fucked all that shit up, too. In, in what ways? How do you think it did that? Bro, it made cheating so easy. Bro, I'm telling you, listen. Okay. I got, look, I got married in 20, 20, I don't even fucking remember. 2015, 2016. Last day. 2015. 2015. I got married in January 2015. I'll never fucking forget. I get divorced in 2018. Yeah. Okay. So, like, within, like, six months, I get back, like, you know, fully on social media. I'm doing all the shit. For the first time ever in my life, I'm seeing women slide into my DMs. You know what I'm saying? Like, pre me getting married was like, you know, you had to, like, slide in the girls' DMs. Trying to make it. It's like, now it's, like, reverse. Like, they're coming to you. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you're you're single now, so. Well, even even so, but even you know, I'll I'll straight up tell you right now. So so once you got married, they started doing that. Well, no, I mean, like no, I, didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't really on social media. I was, I was right, literally right, right, working right, right. so much; it was fucking insane. Like I didn't really give a shit about social media. You know, right. I, mean, I wasn't DJing. Like I was building a company, mm -hmm. so like I wasn't. I I took some time off from DJing and whatnot. So I was never really on social media. I just fucking focused on myself. But like, mm -hmm. even my friends that are married today. You know how many dudes slide into their wives' DMs, like, you know, and then how many girls slide into their husbands' DMs? I actually think you get more people sliding into your DMs if you have somebody. There's people who want to cheat that don't want a relationship. So, like, these are the perfect fucking people for that to do so. You know what I mean? And it's sad. It's wicked. It, is. it, it is wicked. It's wicked. wicked. But, like, you know, at the same fucking time, for me, it's just like, you know, I like to focus on myself, do me. If I ever find the right person, I'm mm -hmm. not opposed to getting married, but I got to be with that person for a long fucking time. Yeah, it different. And, yeah, and then now I at least know what to look for. Like, back in the day, I just wanted, like, a sexy-ass girl, you know, whatnot. These days, like, if you're not going to bring something to the fucking table, mm -hmm. there's not a chance I'll even get into a relationship with you, let alone. So you, you would know, say your, your previous, let's say, mistakes brought a new set of values to you. A hundred percent. Oh, yeah, a hundred percent. I'm telling you, you'll literally change what you look for when you go through that experience. Because, you know, I never thought, like, about who's going to raise my kid. And I'm going to tell you something right now. <clears throat> one of the one of the things I'm going to fucking say that I'm extremely thankful for is even though her and I had our issues, she's a phenomenal mom to my son. So, like, that's one great thing because if I'm not going to get to see my son every day, I at least want to know he's in good hands. You know what I mean? And <laughs> he's in great hands because, I mean, he's raised right, he treats him right, everything else so that's one good thing but like other people aren't that fucking lucky you know what i mean so like that's why one thing like that made that uh you know me not having full custody of my son a little bit easier mm -hmm. but at the same time you know it's just now you're like okay if i'm gonna get into something with somebody what are they gonna bring to the table you know what i mean i don't want i you gotta have a backbone like i told you you know earlier i have a company i'm a businessman i invest you know i invest in different companies i do these things you want somebody who's going to be like your backbone and your support to keep pushing you to be better and better yourself rather than somebody who just says, give me, give me, give me, give me, and then, you know, don't don't give back. And I'm not saying I want somebody to come in and put money into the relationship or whatnot, but at least offer support, you know, push me to be better. Don't be like, oh, you work too much, you're doing this. Like, if I'm providing a hell of a life and I'm providing a great income so we can do whatever the fuck we want and build an empire so one day mm -hmm. I don't have to work, you know, that should be something you should be thankful for because this is, like, at the end of the day, people got to understand it's for everybody. It's for us, the kids, like everything we're going to do. And that's like something I don't think you look at before you experience such a bad experience. Mm.
Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, I know that, that that's the very uh, trying experience and a lot, oh, yeah, it's a lot to go through, especially yeah. when you're young. You know, like you go into a thing that's going to be this one and it doesn't work out this way, and then the result is definitely not what you think it's going to be, and you have a little bit. You know, sometimes you have a little harsh realities. Yeah, you do. And mm -hmm. make the most out of it. You exactly. Know? I mean, just know, you know, try to stay out of the legal system if you can just make amends mm -hmm. like on your own. Just do it because spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that could literally go towards your kids. Like, it's mm -hmm. fucking wasted anyway, you know what I mean? So just, you know, just try to do things right. And, you know, if you go through a bad experience, life ain't over. Keep, keep moving. I mean, I've been 10 times happier since. I've done 10 times more. I've been able to accomplish 10 times more. So it's mm -hmm. not like, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I went through this. No, it's okay. You know what I mean? Just keep your head up and keep fucking grinding and keep moving and be all right. Mm -hmm. Well, to lighten up the subject, uh, first residency. First talk, residency. Talk about it. Yeah, my first residency was at Zen and Station Square. Okay. That's when Station Square was still popping. So mm. people don't know about Station Square. I, I used to hear about it all the time. Station Square was was this, Station this, this, Square. Uh, you know, I was still in high school. You know, it was like it's like I think my senior year in high school. It was like 16, 17 at the time. And uh, you know, I got my first uh, residency. I actually started off as a guest DJ there, but uh. Mm. A lot of my friends were just getting into college, or they were going to college, so like I would go visit them. And Zen used to have this thing where if you bring in the way they paid, is they paid a flat base plus for everybody on your guest list, you got a cut. So mm. I was still like, you know, about to go to college. My friends were on calls, so I was using these people to promote. Keep in mind, my back then there was no Instagram, right. there was no Facebook. I mean, Facebook was like a couple years old, yeah. Um, but it was just, you know, you're bringing these people, so I was bringing all these people, and I started getting residencies, and since then, like. DJ at all the other spots and you know in the station square and then the strip was hot for a minute as well mm -hmm. um, and then South like Southside wasn't it back then it wasn't no what, hell no what you mean like Southside wasn't the spot like there was I think there was one club in Southside at the time called Town Tavern and there was like S Bar which is now uh, Cosmo hmm. but that was really it like Jimmy D you know these dive bars but like if you wanted to go like clubbing it was either Station Square or the strip at the time. Hmm. Yeah, that was the, those were the best times ever, man. Clubs like the nightlife scene, I don't think it's the same in Pittsburgh. The clubs used to be unreal. So, what's a piece of advice that you could give a young DJ stepping into his first residency, his or her first residency? Um, just brand yourself, build a brand. I feel like you know the most important thing about anything, um, whether you're a DJ or any type of artist, is building a brand, letting something become recognizable that everybody sees. Because I feel like that's that's what will start that's what will be your stepping stone into future growth and continued growth. And at the same time, you know, treat it like it's worth it. Like, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, you know, treat it right and it'll be good to you. You know, my first residency was my stepping stone into everything else I did in my life. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, and it's something I'll never forget. It was one of my favorite things I ever did. You know what I mean? So, it's just, you know, work hard, bust your ass, promote, 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 bring those mm -hmm. people in there because that's what's going to get you in there. And at the same time, build that brand. This is your chance. So, uh, when it comes to being in the club, uh, a lot of people walk up to you and approach you. What would you say are some do's and don'ts for artists and, let's say, uh, just club goers, do's and don'ts when approaching a DJ? Yeah, see, like, one of the biggest things, um, a lot of people, like, for example, for me, a lot of people think I'm an asshole. I mean, I, I'm not an asshole. I've just been through a lot. There's just some shit I just don't put up with. Hmm. So, but I'm actually, like, a sweet-ass guy, like, underneath. Like, one of the biggest things for me is, like, you know, be humble. Let people like you. One of the biggest things, like, I think my, what tributed to my comeback this year was all the college chicks. Like, honestly, because they come up asking for requests, and I'm like, yeah, here, I got you. Like, I don't mind playing a request under one concern. If you're a club goer and you ask for a request, don't come back up to the fucking DJ booth and ask for it again. I got you. I will play when I get to, because a lot of people don't understand, like, you got to be at the right tempo, the right day. Yeah, right or if you say no... That's just leave me alone. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, like, I don't want to be the DJ that says no request. Fuck that. No, I mean, I'm there to provide people a good experience. Like, at the end of the day, DJs also got to humble the fuck up and understand, like, those people mm -hmm. are what's going to keep you in this fucking club. So you keep yeah. them happy, you're good. Um, but, I said, you know, I said I'm guilty of that. I used to get, like, really upset when people kept asking for requests over and over and over and over. Like, I'll have nights where, you know, yo, can you play this? And they're just standing there right next to you, staring yeah, at like, you, yeah, like, yeah. Into your soul with their phone out, yo, play, can you play this, can you play that? And it's like, yo, like, like, why are you so close to me? Please back up, like, I have a job to do. Yeah, I mean, still. I'll straight up, like, if somebody asks me for a request, I'll be like, yeah, just give me 10, 15 minutes to get to the right yeah. spot. You know what I mean? I kind of just set that groundwork. But, yeah. but you're, you're right, those are the people that, you know, keep us in business and keep, oh, absolutely. keep things going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of, one of the biggest things, I hate people on my DJ booth. 
Mm -hmm. I like to focus. Like I told you, I quick mix. So like I like, yeah. I like to just in. be focused. I like to read my crowd. One of the biggest things about being a DJ too, you know, to touch up on that, you got to be able to read the room. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're a terrible mixer. Mm -hmm. If you play the right fucking music, you will tear that club up. Like literally, mm -hmm. you don't even have to beat match one song. Mm -hmm. If you play the right fucking songs, you can cold drop them all night and people will go fucking crazy. So for me, one of the things I'm thankful for is I have a great ability to read the room. I can, you know, have great music knowledge. So like I know a shit ton of songs, especially you know, I've been around since like late 90s, early 2000s. I grew yeah. up on that shit. So I know what works. I know what doesn't. But at the same time. I know if I dropped a song and people went fucking nuts right now, what I should continue to play because people are going to continue to vibe to it. I also know if I dropped a song that didn't go over well, I know what to not play for the rest of the fucking night. Right. And that's one of the biggest things. Like, I don't like to be bothered. I like to be able to quick mix. I like to be able to read the room just mm -hmm. so I can give, you know, the people who are coming out to the club just like the best night. I mean, that's that's literally what it's there for. A lot of people just DJ to make that couple hundred bucks. I'm not, I'm there to provide an experience. My, like, that's one of the things that I look forward to every single gig that I do. I actually make my own edits. So like every mm. single one of my songs, you, I've either done a hype up or a rework or a work how, play. How do you do any of those three things? So I've, I've actually been doing it. So back in the day when I actually started DJing, I actually used to create remixes for a, uh, for a record pool called Crack for DJs. So Crack for DJs was part of the Crooklyn Clan. I don't know if you're familiar with the Crooklyn Clan, but that's also a record pool. It was one of the largest record pool ever before you got, like, now you got Club Killers, Direct Music Service, mm -hmm. um, BPM, DJ City, DJ Frank, Frank. Frank. Back in the day, it was literally 90% of the edits were on Crooklyn Clan. So for you to get into the Crooklyn Clan, you had to start off at their Crack for DJ sites, which was a mm -hmm. little bit cheaper. They had amazing edits on that site, but you had to be ranked in the number one producer of tracks like you had to sell the most for three consecutive months and then you got upgraded to a Crooklyn clan at the time yeah so you know i always like actually funny thing that's that's actually where the name tweet came from so when i used to make mix shows i used to do small mix shows for different radio stations and whatnot and uh you know i didn't really have a dj name but like i would never play original edits so i would do like my own edits like high pops word plays tone plays different stuff like that i thought like I, I like to produce i can play the keys i can do all that so shit. You, you, in, in a way you branded yourself that way instead of like well people start calling me tweak you know what i'm saying like you're tweaking yeah shit. i was tweaking shit up so yeah. people started calling me tweak and then just kind of stuck to it and you know, I always realize like when people notice like when they're in the club. So if you're using like hype ups or like different hype ups, definitely make people go fucking nuts. What's a hype up for those who don't know? Hype up is like you know like you use like hype up vocals like uh, to my ladies run this motherfucker head. You right. know what I'm saying? Like right. it, it makes people go fucking nuts. So you got like okay. one of my favorite fucking people on earth is Fat Man Scoop. I love his fucking voice. Man. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. I actually got a shit ton of DJ drops, a custom draw from that I put in, mm -hmm. and I make my own remixes with. Um, but like. Hype ups make people go fucking crazy. Then you got word plays where you use certain words from different songs to kind of transition yeah. to another song using mm -hmm. the same words. That shit, if people, you you might think people aren't paying attention. When people pay attention, like holy fuck, that was the best transition ever. Mm -hmm. So when you get that, you're like, you know what? I kind of want to start doing this often. So like, you know, and it's not that hard. It's hard to start now if like, you know, you just if you want to start DJing and doing straight straight, straight custom edits. I mean, it's yeah. gonna take you months and months and months to build. Is there a certain to program set. you edit? All of I use thing? Ableton Live. Man. Ableton, Ableton Live. I'm obsessed. Yeah, Ableton okay. Live is my uh, is my software. But you know, I just I just create them. So you know, I might take a song, hmm. make a longer intro, create some hype ups. You know, add some effects, do some stuff, and I do that for every single one of my songs that I play. Now, there's certain ones I might not do anything to them. I'll just make an intro for it, just play it in there, but. You know, if you ever came and listened to me because I quick, like, I have to kind of make my own edits because I quick mix. Like, certain songs, I don't even play a verse from them. I just go literally from hook. one chorus, yeah, from the hook to the yeah. next hook. You know what maybe I mean? Maybe bridge, maybe, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like, literally, like, I might just do, like, um, you know, if it's a 32 bar hook, I'll do, like, a 16 bar intro, drop it halfway through one hook yeah. so people can start hearing it come in, boom, transition right into it. That's it. Like, some yeah. certain songs, that's all I play from. Other ones, I'll play, like, hype ups and I might do, you know, the, the full verse or. And then part of the hook is something I might do not. Like, I might just cut off and, like, echo out and then maybe do, like, a cold drop. It just keeps it creative, man. I like to I like to do creative mixing and give mm -hmm. my people a show every single time. You don't want to be that DJ, and there's a bunch of them out there. Like, not even in the city, but in like many different cities where it's, like, you know what song's going on next. Because they it's, like, almost like they have a program fucking set every single time. Now, I'm guilty of that in certain stuff because mm -hmm. I make word plays and stuff. I have to, uh, you know... 
use the same songs because they just work together. But like, if you don't even have that, and it's like the same, it's like just original songs, the same one, same one. It just gets boring. Like you know, what I mean, you got to give people an experience that they don't forget because that is actually. What keeps people coming back? Like they're gonna be like, oh my god, look, last night we were out. Like, I'm like, yo, I don't want to go here. Yeah, this, this, this ain't like that, and this one. Yeah, it's not even that. Like people just be like, oh my god, like you know, last night, like the DJ didn't mix the same. It was fucking sick, or like yeah. you know, he did that, or like, hey, like me and my friends went fucking nuts. And sometimes they might not even realize it's the DJ. Hmm. Sometimes you might play these hype ups, get people all hyped up, and they're doing all the stuff, and they just have such a great time with their fucking friends, not realizing it's the fucking DJ, and it's just that becomes their spot, that becomes the game. You know what I mean? Just uh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta. Work on your craft. You know, you got to make yourself unique and different. I think that's what's going to help you grow as a DJ. What are your thoughts on the Pittsburgh music scene? What do you, What do you think it lacks? What do you What do you love about it? Be brutally honest. Uh, it, no, I mean I will be brutally honest. Yeah. Um, number one, you know, I think the city of Pittsburgh has a phenomenal music scene in the hip hop sense. I think uh, we're in, in an amazing hip hop city. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. You got the likes of Wiz Khalifa, Mac Miller, Hardo, you know, that's, that fed the God. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's fucking awesome. You know, I mean, it's awesome that a city can breed superstars yeah. like that in such a short period of time. But at the same fucking time, I think like the city also lacks taste in other music. I'm a hip hop head. I love hip hop. But also in the club, I like to play house music sometimes. Yeah. House music is fucking phenomenal. And I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, house music, house music. A lot of people don't know house music was started by black people. Yeah, was, you know I mean, was, a lot of it was inspired was it, was by it, disco. Was, wasn't it Chicago? It wasn't Chicago. Was Chicago, Chicago House Deep House is yeah. like famous. And, you know and it's, it's world like house music is worldwide. Like it's, it's worldwide. It, you hear it in movies. You hear it in all the soundtracks. See, that's the kind of why I'm more leaning towards Video uh, yeah. house music. It's not. It's not like one. I enjoy it, but I feel yeah. like a club should always be vibing. It should be upbeat. And at the same fucking time, like I told you, I make my own edits. So sometimes mm -hmm. I kind of like. I don't want to say I made my own genre, but like I do something called hip house, where I'll literally take hip hop lyrics or I'll remix a song. But Tweet I just, just Tweet just created his own genre, y'all. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, like you know, I actually like make my own edits that are house remixes mm -hmm. of popular hip hop songs, and they're fucking fire. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, like every city I feel has uh, a um, you know a melting pot of music lovers that like different music. This city is one of the hardest cities for any DJ to play in if you're not from the city because you have to do 90% of your of, of your uh, set as hip hop like I actually have two residencies in Cleveland right now yeah we're, we're 80, at. Uh, one is called Inferno and the other one's called Ivy so I'm there monthly um, but over there in Cleveland you know similar crowd and whatnot but if you don't play 75% of your set as hip hop I mean uh, uh, sorry as a uh, as house you actually clear the club and everybody fucking loves it. it's crazy in because Cleveland. like it's so different. Yeah, that's yeah. why I actually love it. It's so different. Um, here in Pittsburgh, you you'll clear the club if you don't play ninety percent hip hop. Yeah, Pittsburgh's a, a trap city. It is one hundred percent. But I mean, like, you can still love trap and like the problem. Been. The problem is, man. Look, like, I got residency at Foxdale. It's like literally one of my favorite clubs on earth to play at. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's crazy. You know they got. The hazers, they got the lights, they got the insane sound system, the subwoofers. You know, you're playing banger after banger, and it's all trap or whatnot. But the people on the dance floor just standing. I mean, they're having a good fucking time, but they're just standing there. You know what I mean? Like sometimes I'll bring in a photographer, and it just looks like like the night is beat because like you know everybody's like going fucking crazy or whatnot. But you just can't do it. The songs are 70 and 65 beats per minute. Period. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like you know, like I was saying, like you can't do it with songs that are 65 and 70 beats per minute. Yeah, I mean, you're just going to sit there and do whatever. I mean, yeah, they're still having a good time because they enjoy the music, but, like, you can't really dance to it. Like, you're not on the dance floor. It's fucking phenomenal music. I'm telling you, I love it. It's my favorite It's my favorite shit to listen to as well. But, like, I feel like a club needs to be more more up. Like, you got to go crazy. And a lot of DJs, too, like, they don't understand. It's actually easy to make those into more upbeat remixes because, like, 65 can actually blend into 130 BPMs. 130 is house music. So you can literally take 65, you double the speed, you're at 130, and you can literally make any 65 song upbeat, go crazy. Now, I know Pittsburgh doesn't have the greatest house scene, but honestly, like, I've, I haven't seen a negative reaction to you playing a hip house remix where <laughs> people still know the lyrics. You know, I think, like, a lot of houses, because it turns people off, people look for lyrics, especially in this city. So, like, I house mean, music, a lot of it don't have lyrics, you know what I mean? I, I think people look for lyrics also because we don't talk to each other. Yeah, we're always on our phones, right. yeah. on social media. You know, like you might go to the bar, get a drink, and see somebody you know, or might want to get to know, 
and you don't have a conversation with them because yeah. we don't speak to each other no more for real. Like, right. like na it's natural. Like if if it's just house music or instrumentals, people can still enjoy it. You just gotta talk to each other now because now there's no words. Exactly. Yeah. No. I no. I agree. And like I said, like you go to Chicago, dude, the scene is fucking. I'm running all house music. Like yeah. the underground scene is house, and like oh, you'll yeah. see all sorts of people. You know what I mean? Like it's just it's it's crazy that the city cannot turn that out. But like I said, you know, I'm hoping to slowly introduce that using hip hop. Create the market. Like, yeah, because if, like if there's no market, make it. Exactly. And it's just like the same songs we're just gonna hear, but we're just gonna get a little bit more lively. We're gonna get the girls to kinda go crazy, you know, throw their hands in the air, do something mm -hmm. crazy. Just like dance on the fucking dance floor. That's why it's called dance floor. I just I hate when people stand around like Well for for those watching, uh can you describe Carson Street? Carson Street. Uh I fucking love it. I love it. Well, East Carson. <laughs> yeah, East Carson <laughs> Street. I mean, I fucking love it. You know, it's um, it's known to actually be the street that has the most restaurants and bars per capita on earth. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, it's, it's a fucking blast. You know, you can walk down, you can uh, bar hop from one bar to a club to another. You know, you can get great food, see great people. One of my favorite fucking things about Carson Street, though, is whenever I walk it, I know everybody. Mm -hmm. It's the fucking best. Tweet, you know I mean? tweet, yeah. tweet. Yeah, but I mean, like, even, like, you know, it's it's cool because a lot of people talk about, oh, you know, Carson Street's not safe. No, fuck that. Actually, it feels like the safest fucking... I know it, everybody. It, it, it's you know not... Mean? Carson Street is not unsafe. No, it's not. If you're inebriated and have no control of yourself... Facts. That's then, exactly what I was going to say. Then yeah. you're unsafe, and those people that get like that are unsafe, but it's really not... I don't, I don't feel like it's unsafe. Like I said, like, you know, you walk down the street, you know everybody. What's what's safer than knowing everybody on the fucking street? You get into a fucking problem, you know everybody's going to be there. You know what I mean? It's just, uh, I don't know, it's uh, it's nostalgic. For, I fucking love Carson Street, man. I love walking down just knowing everybody, you know, in the clubs. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's cool. What was it like throwing that infamous pool party this past summer? Oh, dude, this shit was wild. Talk about it. How'd you do it? How'd you set it up? What, 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 what prompted it? And um, what was the outcome? It was fucking awesome. I mean, we did we did a bunch of them, and just they just kept growing. So uh, I live in Southside Works next to the Cheesecake Factory in that complex. And mm -hmm. We have outdoor pool, like cabanas, all sorts of cool stuff. So, you know, I have some friends that also live in the building that like to go and whatnot. We're just like, you know, like, you know, let's throw a pool party on a Sunday, do like a Sunday fun day pool party, and then, you know, just DJ and whatnot, do a BYOB. So we did the first one. Put, made a flyer, posted about it. We had like 200 people show up. It was pretty cool. Like, we were like, all right, 200 people, not too bad. You know, place is fucking huge. Um, the next one had like 400. So on the third one, we were like, hey, you know, let's go ahead and, you know, do some tacos, like, or something like to cater food to people. Everyone, like, wanted to order food all the time and was hungry and whatnot. So I hit up, uh, I hit up Ember. They do Taco Tuesdays. They have fire tacos. So shout out like, to Ember. Shout out to Ember. Yeah, so I hit up actually Cuts by Lito, my boy. Um, and I was like, hey, like, do you think you can get, you know, the people who do your tacos to come and cater tacos? He's like, you know, let me ask. So he did it. So we did taco catering. Also hit up my boys at Layali Hookah Lounge. I had them come out and, uh, you know, cater hookahs because everybody, like, I, I love hookah. It's one of my things. It's like one of my vices. I love that shit. Yeah, so, like, you know, seem like somebody who smoke hookah. Oh, bro. Every I'm not going to lie to you, man. I love hookah, bro. I mean, you hookah, have, your, you hookah, have your own hookah. Oh, fuck. I have my own hookahs, bro. I used to, I used to, actually, I used to own a hookah lounge. Really? Oh, yeah. In Oakland. What the fuck? Where? It's called Illusion now. It used to be called Mint. It's on Semple Street. I used to hear about Mint. Yeah, Mint was mine. So I actually used to DJ every Friday and Saturday there, and it was like the only place for people under 21 to party a pit. So, because we were 18 and over at the time, because the hookah used to be 18 and over. Tobacco. Yeah, tobacco used to be 18 and over. Yeah, so like people used to come down. Like, if you were a college student, you couldn't go out. Yeah. You would come down there, and then, you know, you had a place to party. We had lights, sound, it was unreal, hookah, was super <clears> fucking <throat> nice. And then we also did it BYOB for people who were 21 and over. Hmm. So, yeah, man, that was, like, the party spot in Oakland, literally yeah. for, like, four years. And we were open till 4 a.m. So, like, we would yeah, almost yeah, rotate yeah. three different fucking crowds because we start DJ at, like, 10. Yeah. So people didn't want to DJ, just want to chill. They'd go, like, yeah. before 10, so you had that one crowd. Then you have the crowd that wanted to be there during the DJ from, like, 10 to, to 1 to 2 or whatnot. And then you had all the after-hours people that had nowhere else to go. Just want some hookah and some food. They just want to chill. They'd come, yeah. And I, like, I had a gyro stand uh, outside, and then we ended up actually running, like, the place two doors down and turning into a gyro shop. Yeah, that, 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 that was my life for, like, four or five years. I actually yeah. loved it, yeah. And that's what's up. Yeah, hell yeah. So we'll, we'll touch back on that. But right. back to the pool party. You were, you were yeah, so back to the middle. pool parties, man. And then this, uh, I would have uh, 
we would do recap videos of every single one. You know what I mean? That's that's one of my things. Every single gig I do, uh, well, at least like the bigger ones, what I do is mm -hmm. I'll bring uh, my, uh, my videographer, his name is Tom Spags. Shout out to him, he's fucking awesome. Uh, he'd come on, he'd do this videotape, make recaps. So we were doing them, and these fucking things, people were like seeing me in the street, like, bro, where the fuck is this pool party? Like, literally, people will see me in the fucking street. Because I put my face on these slides. I don't give a mm -hmm. fuck. Dude, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. fuck yeah, brand my shit. So, like, people see me, like, bro, where is that? I'm like, yo, just follow me on Instagram. I'm going to post the next one. You know, when you post, just comment and guest list. Bro, we had 700 people show up to the third one. What was the max capacity? I don't think, like, there is a max capacity, but you're talking about, like, during COVID, during surge. This it's, was it's during COVID. Private, it's this, was private last, building. this was last summer, like yeah. I said, private building. Yep. And this was during the surge. Like, this was, like, COVID didn't end. No, COVID definitely didn't fuck. I mean, it's still Co going on. COVID but, like, technically it was, not over, it was but surging at the, the time. You know, like the the scare. Let's say that the scare was still like it was still going on. It was still kind of going on. The vaccines were in talks. I think at the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. nothing was. You know, it was still nothing going crazy. Down. Yeah, but I think little. that was around the time we went into green. It was right around the time. Like, we went like, like right around the time we went into green. So it was it was kind of like kind of get away with it. Oh yeah, I mean we did. I mean like I said for the most part, but like you know we started the party at one. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to be till six, I think. And then what we would do normally at the ice DJ Sky Bar at night every single Sunday, because in the summer we opened up the pool one. Yeah. So the yeah. idea was to bring everybody there, and then we all go to Sky Bar. So like, you can't fit seven hundred people in Sky. No, you definitely can't. <laughs> even like, not everybody went out at the same right. time. You, mm -hmm. you, at Sky Bar, you actually got spent money. You yeah. know what I Because mean? like my my shit, you just brought your own drinks. Mm -hmm. So you know, it was like a cool spot for you to pregame, have some fun, and then take your crew and go out and actually have a good time. Mm -hmm. So like, you know. It was like 100 people and 200, and we, then people were seeing like people posting shit, and then like like posting and people were like, "Where are you at? I'm coming, I'm coming." So then we ended up like with 700 plus people. The building called me. Like the building people, extremely nice. They're like, "Dude, like we love you and like we appreciate this." They're like, "But you know, it's a." Uh, it was Fourth of July. I forget. Like, mm -hmm. It's a holiday weekend. People want to go down there with their kids, and you got 700 people in the courtyard. Like people are everywhere. <laughs> you got 200 bottles of alcohol. Because literally, bro, people were bringing them bottles in 1942. It was, oh, you name it. It was like fucking everywhere. And it was. I mean, it was a fucking blast. But yeah, that one got shut down. I'll never forget it. We all packed up. And we all <laughs> we all went to uh, Skybar. And, like you walked in the Skybar. It was like 5 p.m. Only got shut down like an hour early. Mm -hmm. Fucking pack bro you couldn't even walk in it was fucking amazing it's like this this was a phenomenal summer that's what i'm telling you i like i look forward to doing it again in 2022 uh, so i wish i could have went to that party <laughs> hey, don't worry man we got we got we, we got them coming this summer yeah I'll, I'll, I'll be at the next one man i had, to, yeah. I had to go be at the radio station the hell yeah. well, but yeah, I, I, I saw that y'all like for real I, I remember seeing it and just thinking yo where, where is this pool at where is yeah. this at? i've never seen this i don't know where this is but they're saying it's on the south side oh, everybody's dude. going people i went to school with are going People that aren't even from here that I know are just like around the way. Oh, they, they were like, legendary. I literally like it. Literally, I would walk through the fucking South Side. Mm -hmm. Great fucking pool party, man! Great pool party. Like, what pool party? And people were shouting. People I'm like, holy fuck! Like, when's that next one? Like, it was it was fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. What are some goals you got in your career? Um, as a DJ. As a DJ, I mean, at this point, like I said, you know, um, I've been doing this 16, 17 years at this point, uh, like professionally, like actually DJing in clubs. At this point, I kind of just want to focus on trying to get residencies outside of the state and just travel a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I've accomplished what everyone's accomplished. You know, I've made great music. I make great remixes. I've DJed in a ton of places. I mean, I've DJed in places a lot of people don't even know I've DJed at. And, you know, some places that people wish they can get into. Such as? Let's go. Like, I've DJed in Vegas a couple different spots. I mean, like, you know, you, it's not it's not a prime Friday, Saturday night gig, but like they were at those clubs that are like the biggest ones, but maybe like on a random Tuesday one. They were still packed, but it's not like, you know, they're Saturday or Friday night packed. But you know, I got I got the chance to experience great places. I actually even DJed spring break in Cancun through a company called Student City. So Student mm. City used to throw uh, um, you know, spring break packages. They still do for students where they'd run a whole like a couple of whole entire resorts. And you just get a package, so inclusive. You go down. So I would go down for like a month at a time in March. Hmm. Literally, they pay you down to go down for a month and DJ every fucking day. And the way the gigs work is, you do some on the resort, like they set up a stage, trusses, lights, you fucking name it. And then at night, they would contract with the different clubs to bring the crowds there. So like, you know, I was DJing twice a day. Like, did that shit for six years. Like, I've hmm. actually been to Cancun thirty-two times because of it. Damn. Oh yeah, I love Cancun. Yeah. So, you know, there's like a lot of cool stuff that, you know, I was able to do. So at this point, I just kind of want to 
get a couple residencies or just start like getting almost like setting up like almost like tours where every week I can play a different city, have a good time, different clubs, different people. I just want to like, you know, bring my creativity to different places. Though. What's some advice you could give to upcoming DJ? Um, honestly, uh, one of the biggest ones is be passionate about this because this isn't like if you're doing this just to make a few hundred bucks on the weekends, you mm -hmm. know, you're never gonna make it. Just being quite honest with you, you gotta yeah. be passionate. You gotta love what you do. And one of the biggest things I always tell people is learn to read a room because it's the most important. You could be a terrible DJ, like I told you earlier, play the right songs, you'll fucking kill it. And number two, you gotta build a brand. Build a brand, build a brand, build a brand. Mm -hmm. Invest in yourself, you become recognizable. That's how you start getting gigs. That's how you start getting higher paid gigs. Like, you know, a lot of DJs probably will do gigs for half or a third of what I, I, I won't. Like, I pick and choose my gigs. If I'm not getting a specific minimum, I'm not doing them. Part of the reason why I'm even able to have that option or that choice is because of the way I do my branding. You know, I invest in myself, I do photos video recaps, flyers mm -hmm. for every single gig. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, is going to help bring people into a club. So let me tell you something. If you're bringing people to a club and you're selling out tables and you go to a club, you're like, hey, I'm doing this every single week. I need more money. They're going to give it to you. They're not going to let you go. And that's what a lot of people just, you know, just don't understand. I'm not going to go DJ for peanuts or, you know, a club at the same time. You know, I love what I do. I want to be able to bring my creativity and, you know, you just got to do it right. Branding, 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 branding. I can never tell anybody. It's because you got to treat it like a business. Right. I mean, it is a business. You're, you're your own entity. You're, you're, it's, it's your own thing. Facts. But, I mean, like, a lot of people don't treat it that way. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. like, you never treat your business uh, like shit. You know what I mean? Right. It's like your money maker. Right. So, you know, I just, it's, it's all about branding and marketing. I mean, you cannot have a business if you're not branding the business and mm -hmm. creating a brand and, you know, putting it out there. You know, whether it's a restaurant or anything else. If you're not doing that, you're, not gonna, you're never going to make it. Mm -hmm. You have another business, right? Yeah. What is a lot of people don't know about it actually. Uh, what, what, uh, can we can we get the exclusive? What is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm actually a founder and CEO of a tech company. So uh, okay. the company is called Dealer Venom. Uh, we build software for car dealerships, and uh, what do you, what, the software we build. So basically, what we do is we have a you know a modern website platform. Because a lot of I don't know if you ever shop for a car, but a lot of their the, I the, mean, a lot of the website I built them. You know, yeah, never yeah. went to the dealer and. Well, well, that, well, that's, did, but like, that's like you're building them on the OEM side. If you go to like a dealer's website, their uh, their websites are very outdated. Like, there's actually only about ten companies in the United States that do websites for car dealerships because mm -hmm. they're not general websites. Like, you got to be able to integrate to all their internal systems, pull data, information, send information, and like it's actually like very, uh, it's a very convoluted system. You know what I mean? So, uh, I was in automotive. Um, while I was in college, I actually worked in automotive, sold cars, I was always techie, and then it was like, holy shit, like, shit's old, it's crappy, so, um, that's actually why I gave up DJ for five years. I started, mm -hmm. I got, I got the idea to, um, build, like, a modern day website platform for car dealerships, so what I did at the time is I sold the hookah lounge, and I used that funding to start creating this piece of software, and, uh, you know, what makes us unique is we're the only ones, like, Built on the cloud, a lot of people don't know what the cloud is, but like so, it's just like so it's like not an individual install on a server. Like we're we're the only platform that if Google tomorrow came and said, hey, in order not to rank on Google, you gotta have a specific, uh, you know, your platform has to run a certain way. We can actually make the change and deploy it to all of our sites simultaneously. While everybody else has to fucking sit there and do it on a per site, so they'll never be able to do it. That's I mean, why these websites were so outdated. What do you mean disperse it on a site? Like, how, how do you distribute it on multiple sites at once? So you build a platform and not a website. So, like, these websites run off of a platform. So, like, uh, you know, a lot of our competitors, every like, single one like, of the websites like, is individual. Yeah, like, they run off, like, GoDaddy or Wix or something. No, 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 I mean, they, that's, no, no, just think of it like you built, like, an individual website for yeah. yourself, right? Yeah. And tomorrow you built another website. Yeah. Well, if you go make a change to your website, it's not going to take effect on the other one because you just built the website you didn't build the platform. So you have to build the platform for all the other websites. Correct. And then like you basically you take that platform, it runs from like a repository of codes. So anytime you make changes to a repository, you can deploy it. So now what's repository mean? Repository is a is a online place that holds that code. Like the okay. repository is like a centralized system that holds that code and then you got all these websites on all these servers that you can deploy the code to go and override these things. So basically we built a pl platform that you can theme it so all the websites can look different. Hmm. But, you know, we were the only ones that were cloud-based, so we started growing. 
Um, and in like 2018, December, we got the attention of Toyota North America. So Toyota made us one of their four approved providers in one of four in the whole entire North America region. So like, so as far yeah. as here to let's say Canada and Alaska, yeah, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, we have hundreds of clients all over the country. So your the, the platform that you build for the website to look and be directed through? Yeah, it works. Like if you go shopping for a car, ours runs on voice search. Like you can do, it also runs on instant search. So as you're typing stuff, it's guessing what you're typing. It'll start running. So we run on AI. We do a lot of really right. cool stuff. Um, and then, you know, once we started doing that, like I said, we got attention at Toyota. Toyota made us one of four uh, proof providers. So we just started fucking growing like mm -hmm. instantly, which is why, like I said, I needed to take some time off to be able to control that, you know, hire the right people, put the right people on spot. And that's one of the biggest things, like, I was connected because I was in automotive, so I was able to hire yeah. rock stars. Like, my team's a fucking team of rock stars. What did you, um, what did you do in automotive early on? Sold cars. Just sold them? Yeah, but I mean, like, I, you know, I learned the, the industry. Like, right, you know, right, right. Yeah, I was young as hell, like, I was learning everything. Um, one of the owners of a dealership, I used to work for a Honda dealership, mm -hmm. He literally took me under his wing, literally fucking taught me everything, taught me how to praise cars. I was doing like all sorts of crazy shit. So in the same time, you know, you just learn the industry and you're like, fuck, these websites suck because they should be able to do all this stuff. So we did it. And then when Toyota, when we became a partner, we were growing and whatnot, there was a company we used to outsource some work to to do digital advertising because we were also supposed to do digital advertising, like Google ads, Facebook ads, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So there was a local company in Pittsburgh called WebKite. So they were built by four CMU students, they built an algorithm that takes your inventory, scrapes it, and builds hundreds of thousands of ads, which the human person can't build hundreds of thousands of inventory, inventory specific ads every month, because you gotta keep the ads updated. So it's so, great data. So, so they'll make ads for each individual car? Or yeah, but like, they're they're smart ads. So like, for example, right. let's say you're looking, let's give you an example, let's say you're looking for a BMW M5 in mm -hmm. black. Well, if you go and type that on Google, chances are you're just gonna see the different uh, BMW, dealerships, their ads, but nothing's going to be specific to the M5, so it's not very relevant. So what this system would do is it will build hundreds of thousands of ads with different keywords and variables in there. So when you're typing that in there, it's going to say, so-and-so BMW, five black M5s in stock, starting at right. 79,000. Okay, well, Wait, so, so the that ad becomes way more relevant. Where would that, that, that could, I've seen stuff like that, though. Yeah. I think I've seen it on Google, but... You might have, so that's us. So that's your system. So we bought it, yeah. So I actually acquired it last year. Um, you don't we, have to DJ. Anything. No, I don't, no, no. You don't, don't I, mean, I do this for fun. Yeah, yeah, no, it I sounds don't. like you don't have to do anything at no, all. No, I don't, I don't, I don't got a DJ. So that company, when COVID hit, yeah. um, they built that system, like their biggest client ever was Hertz. You know, Hertz. Yeah. So Hertz declared bankruptcy in the beginning of COVID. Mm -hmm. So Hertz owed them so much fucking money they weren't never gonna get it because they just declared bankruptcy. So their investors pulled the fuck out. So this guy came up to me and he was like, hey, like, you know, what's well, cause we approached him before. I was like, you know, if you ever want to sell a company, let me know. Cause like we were paying them a shit ton of money cause we paid them a percentage of all the ads we did for our clients. And we were doing, like I said, we got a couple hundred dealers in the country. So literally bro, we bought the company for pennies on the dollar. Like when I approached Hertz? him, I, no. No, uh, yours. The, the WebCut, the, the, we, 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 we bought WebCut, right, so. Right, right, right. Acquisition. Then, yeah, we did an yeah we did an acquisition. So like we approached them in November, they asked for like a fucking astronomical insane number. Mm -hmm. COVID hits in March. They declare bankruptcy in March. Hurts before the end of March, we had already acquired the shit for pennies compared to what they were asking for before. You know what I'm saying? So we did. We took it. We rebranded it. We just kind of merged it in with our company. It became one of our products. So yeah, I mean, I don't have to DJ. So it cools things, but at the same time, like it's my fucking passion. So like I DJ right now for fun and. That's why I always tell people, like, you know, build your craft, do something, hustle. You know what I'm saying? Like, I took five years off of something I love, you know what I mean, to focus on something bigger. Now I can fucking DJ for the rest of my life and just have a fucking blast. And, you know, as long as the company keeps doing itself and it grows, you know. And one of the biggest things actually was COVID. All right, so COVID-19, let's talk about it. COVID-19. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's weird to say, but COVID-19 for us was a fucking blessing. Um, How so? So our, our platform, because of the ability um, for you to do the instant upgrades and the deployments like we were talking about, mm -hmm. um, it became one of the easiest and most easiest to use online platforms for car shopping in the United States. Mm -hmm. So when you think of that, COVID hit, 
dealerships were required to shut down for a little bit. Within a month, they all went to the, to the government were like, we're essential, so it became essential. So we actually became essential because we we're actually a provider for automotive because we, we strictly do automotive. Hmm. But because our platform was so new, dealers wanted the greatest and latest technologies because people weren't going to fucking dealerships anymore. You weren't even able to. They were able to sell cars, but like they had a rule where it's like one customer at a time. So Carvana probably like boomed over COVID. Oh, 100% they did. Yeah, I mean, Carvana, Carvana definitely boomed. Yeah. Right, what's it called? But I mean, like Carvana is strictly for used cars. Imagine us, we're doing this now for new car dealers. Really? So, like, only, only used cars? Yeah, Carvana only does used cars. No, I didn't know. Yeah, that. so like we okay. kind of brought that concept to new cars. You know what I mean? Okay. So, uh, and we're not the only ones to do it. Like I don't want to say like we invented that concept for new cars in any way, but like I said, like we were that one platform where we can push certain things to all of our websites at once. So when dealers wanted them, we were able to do it. So like we actually fucking boomed during COVID. Like when the first like COVID hit in March when the shutdown first happened, the first month or two, automotive wasn't essential yet. Like they they were fighting that battle. Mm -hmm. We were fucking terrified, though. Like, what the fuck are we gonna do? You know, I got employees. My employees count on me. They all got families. Like, and we don't hire just like random mobile. Like, we recruited like my CTO. What's a CTO? Chief Technical Officer. Right. We recruited him from New York at Goldman Sachs. He was at Goldman Sachs for twenty years as their fucking CTO. And Goldman Sachs is. It's a investment. It's fucking the largest investment firm on the planet, yeah. Large investment firm, and these are all Yeah, like, like Wall Street companies. Like, yeah. these are Wall Street, like, if you want to invest in Wall Street, you're going, like, Wall yeah. Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, like, those companies. You know what I mean? So, like, this person worked there. He wasn't their CTO, but, like, mm -hmm. this dude was one of their main developers. He was like, that guy. Yeah, he was that guy. Like, you know, at the same time, so we're, like, hiring the right people. I don't know, man. Strangling. COVID just fucking, you know, then automotive became essential. We just right. fucking boomed. But, like, the craziest thing, because, you know, it's funny you say it, a lot of people who know me as DJ Tweak, would never guess, like, oh, this guy's a CEO of a fucking tech company. Tweak's so, rich, y'all. He just, he's just very no, humble. about that. This, 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 is, this is what it's coming down. I'm not saying rich in finances, but rich yeah. in, like, like, the stuff that you're talking about is, let's say, unfathomable to some. You have a company. Yeah, to some. I, your, your, your company's foundation is automations that affect the whole Automotive industry. Facts. I mean, like, we're one of ten companies that do yeah. automotive. And it benefits, all right, one in ten out of yeah. the entire planet. Yeah. You know I mean, what I mean? Unreal, like, yeah. No, it's cool, but like yeah. I said, you know, at the same fucking time, you know, I feel like anybody can do anything. Honestly, truth. Mm -hmm. um, my whole entire life, you know, I just wanted, I don't want to say I like attention, but I want attention for the right things. You know what I'm saying? So, like, my goal isn't to be the next billionaire, but I want to be known as the person that built a massive automotive tech company. You know what I'm saying? I just like that. Like, it changed the, the, the game. Guy, the guy, the one that changed the fucking game. You the know guy that changed the game and provided opportunity. Exactly. And I feel like everybody can do it. Like, you know, people got to understand. I'm an immigrant. Came here when I was eight years old. You know, my parents didn't have much. My parents busted their ass. Like, my mom's an engineer. She's been a penned up 23 years, but she had to go, you know, get her master's in order to even get that job. So, like, she even did that when she we first moved to the States. Like, we worked hard, you know what I mean? But I always wanted to, like, build something badass. And it's just, you know, everybody got to know. Everybody can fucking do it. Mm -hmm. You just got to be able to make some fucking sacrifices. Like, I love to DJ. Had to take the five years off because I would not have had time to do what I had to. You know what I mean? I was literally working 18, 19 hours a day. I mean, I'm telling you, I lost my marriage. We were talking about that shit over because I was working so fucking much. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? But at the same fucking time, I set goals. I don't give a fuck. There's nobody's going to stand in my way and stop those goals. So it's fucking funny. Like, you know, I talk to people all the time. Like, you know, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I want to do this. But at the same fucking time, it's like, well, I don't have time. But I see him partying out on the weekends. Yeah, you're not. You're never going to fucking do it. And I'm not saying I'd be disrespectful. I think you can. But they, they, the they way you're doing yeah, it, yeah, they the way you yourself, don't know. They don't, it's, I don't even think, I just think it's pure laziness. Hmm? I've seen, like, I like to hang out, like, my friends, like, I like to hang out with my friends, uh, you know, my friends are like-minded people. Like, if you're a fucking hustler and you want to grow, I don't care if you're worth 10 cents. Yeah. But you're ready to bust your fucking ass and do it. That's like me. Like, that's like like-minded. You know what I mean? You got people who are born rich. They're just mm -hmm. dumb as fuck. Don't give a fuck. They're 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 using that money, but it's like depleting. You know, they're not living off of uh, you know off of uh, you know passive income. You know, that, that's one of the biggest things. I think money needs to be educated. Mm -hmm. You know, people need to live off of passive incomes, and that's yeah. that's one of the things they don't you know they don't understand. You know, when you get that kind of money, you have to invest it right and live off of that money. I mean, that's that's how you get rich. I mean, if you make money and you don't you don't live off of passive income, so a lot of people don't even know what what that shit even is. Then Talk your about money it. keeps dropping. Well, basically, passive income is money you make while while you're not working. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like some of my friends basically their whole entire job is flipping cribs. 
yeah. or they buy cribs and they rent them. Yeah, I mean, once you make that investment, you can sleep at your house, never work another fucking day, and then you got all that monthly money coming in. That is called mm -hmm. monthly income and not earned income. If you're living off of earned income, which is your paycheck every fucking month that you get for actually working, you're never going to be rich or you need to continue to work mm -hmm. to make that income. Passive income, it's not going to start high from day one. you got to make little investments to get that money. But you slowly build that up to a point where I'm still working at the time to make that, but that earned income, I'm taking it and reinvesting it to increase my passive income. At one point, it might take you 10 fucking years. Like you're never going to you're never going to make it on day 1. No. You may, you may get lucky. But it NFTs. might take you 10 fucking exactly. But you might or crypto, crypto's fucking huge. But if you might get there in 10 years, imagine right now, you know, you're a young kid, 21, 22 out there buying bottles or like doing whatever like that's a great time for you to network. One of the biggest things I feel like your network is your network. Period. You know what I mean? Yeah. Network. Meet people. Find out ways you can build them that passive income. If you're 21 and it's taken you a fucking 10 years to do it, imagine by your 31, 32, mm -hmm. you don't gotta work and you can make a couple hundred grand a year. Mm -hmm. You might be able to make more. It just depends how you do it. But that's like, I think that's where our education system lacks. Is they don't teach people money and how to make money, right? But you know, I just like to hang out with like-minded people that like to work. They like to bust their ass, and I just feel like everybody can do it. They just gotta fucking want to. Period. It's just that's that's what you gotta make sacrifice. All right, now I'm a rapid fire. I need some questions. What's up? Uh, favorite spot to eat? Favorite spot to eat? Um, actually, <laughs> people are gonna laugh. It's Doe Bar in Southside. Which what? Doe Bar in Southside. What's Doe Bar? Doe Bar is a pizza and rotisserie chicken joint. It's fucking pizza fire. and rotisserie chicken. Yeah, man. It's like it's, it's like a real nice restaurant. You walk in there, a bar opened this year. Like my friends make fun of me because I didn't tell them I want to go I'm like, yo, you want to go to Doe Bar? And they're like, dude, stop with, with Doe Bar. Man. <laughs> I just can't. The fucking deep dish pizza is on real. Favorite DJ equipment. Favorite DJ equipment right now. Uh, I actually just recently switched to CDJ three thousands. Uh, my mixer is a Nexus uh, nine hundred Nexus DJM nine hundred Nexus two Pioneer. I've been on a pioneer kick. I use, I still use turntables in a club. I'm doing hip hop because mm -hmm. I do a lot of house. Like I told you, I use the CDJs. That one I use a uh, rain setup. So I have the okay. 72 and I have the 12s, which is made, which incorporates in Serato and everything else. Favorite BPMs? Favorite BPMs? BPM um, range. Yeah, I'm gonna say between uh, 125 and 132. Okay. So for those who don't know, BPM stands for beats per minute. Uh, it reflects in the tempo or count because when it comes to DJ. Uh, a lot of people don't know it's a lot of math. Yeah, it's all math. Yeah. You know, like counting, listening, paying attention to timing and all of that. Facts, yeah. So that range would be what? Typical house range? All typical club range? Yeah, all a lot of people beat. aren't aware of this. So the reason why. So house music makes you happy. So yeah. if you actually suffer from depression, it's good to listen to house music. And part of the reason why a lot of people don't know this is your optimum heart rate is 125 to 135 beats per minute mm -hmm. um and that's why that music is in that range it like just kind of keeps you know keeps. if you're vibing with it it's kind of just makes you happier slower stuff actually kind of depresses you it's like a fact it's like a oh, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 like what 808s and stuff like that listen yeah. to all this deep bass and all of that it, it could kind of make you feel a little yeah, like a little eerie. Yeah, but no. Love. Yeah, no. I love, I love the upbeat. I want to see people have fun, smile, dance. Mm. You know. Favorite genre of music. Um, so I can't answer that directly because there's different things. Favorite I'm just hit sitting okay. at home listening to music. Yeah, for for, for, for you. All day. Yeah. yeah, for me, for me, it's hip hop. But what I like to produce and play is house music. Okay. Yeah. Hot or cold? Uh, I'd rather be hot. Really? Yeah. I'm not the summer man. Fuck well, I mean, cool. you, I mean, you're you're Syrian. Yeah. That's close to the that's close to the equator, right? It is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we yeah. still get winters. I mean, we get snow in Syria. It's all yeah. mountains and you know ranges. But uh, you know, I just uh, I like I, li I like being hot. I'd rather you know have summer all year. Than cold. Nightclubs or day parties? Nightclubs all day. Okay. Favorite drink? So that's funny. I don't actually drink much, man. I actually hate the taste of alcohol. So it's it, it not tastes like, gross. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's, it doesn't taste good. It's a personal <laughs> thing. It's not even like religious or whatnot. I mm -hmm. fucking despise the taste of alcohol. Whether it's beer, deep liquor, like I'll do shots with my friends every once in a while, just because like sometimes you know you're DJing and your boy comes to the club, will buy you a shot. Like I'm not gonna disrespect him, so I'll fucking take it or whatever. Mm -hmm. So if I if I had to pick a shot, like if I had to take a shot right now, I'm picking tequila. I don't know, it's just fucking a lot of people are like, really? But like to me, like vodka tastes like fucking smells like nail polish or shit's disgusting. It's terrible. Yeah, I like I like vodka, I like gin. I yeah, like I can't. 
I don't like tequila, but I like Sincora. Like, you'll tequila. never actually see me uh, sipping on a drink. Ever. I can't. I've never, never, never you, seen you. Like, like, if I'm out and I'm, I'll shotgun a beer just because it's quick. You just want to get it over with. Yeah, you take like, shots. Yeah, I'll take shot. I mean, I don't even want that either. Like, somebody bought me a shot or whatever, I'll do it. But, like, one of the other DJs in the city, DJ TJ, I don't know. Mm-hmm. He's my boy. Like, that's his, eyeballs, right? Huh? Well, man, man it's eyeballs, right? No, no, no. no, no, no that's, other, that's other, TJ, other yeah, TJ. So, this one is, uh, is a resident of Cabo. Right, right, right. But DJ TJ, he has a thing with shotgun and beer. So, like, it became our thing this summer. Like, every time we see each other at a gig or, like, he'll stop by, we'll shotgun and record the thing. So, like, I'll shotgun a beer or whatever, but, like, you'll never see me sipping on anything, bro. I fucking can't. Like, mm-hmm. I just hate it. And it's just, I despise it. Favorite watch company? Uh, Brightling. So, I like is, Rolexes. What, what is that? That is a Brightling. That is a Brightling? Yeah. Okay. So, I'm obsessed with Brightling. Um, I like big face watches. Okay. Just, you know, Say, like, 44 millimeters and shit like that. Yeah, this one's 48. Like, 48. I like the big, okay. uh, the big face watches. I like Rolex. I'm a fan, but, like, when I went to buy... So, like, when I actually got an investor for my company, mm-hmm. you know, I wanted to find... It was, like, final financial relief for me for once, because, like, I used to always stress, like, hey, I got to make sure everyone's paid and taken care of. Yeah. So, I went and treated myself and got myself... Brightling, but originally I went to get a Rolex. Mm-hmm. The fucking problem with the Rolex is all small faces. Like the max you can get, I think is like forty or forty two. I don't know. I, I just don't like that. So like, when I saw that in the window, I was like, holy fuck, this is what I want. What a big ass watch. Favorite suit company? Suit company? Because you're because you're you're a boss of a tech company. You have time. to wear suits. So, it's local. I like to get my suits done custom at David Allen. David Allen, hey, David hey, Allen. Shout I got it. Shout out to him. I got an interview yeah, so, with him in a couple so, months. One of my one of my great friends. Her name is Krista. She's mm-hmm. the leading stylist there. I I actually went to middle school and high school there. I've noticed since eighth grade. But uh, yeah, I mean, I do all I do custom shirts, custom suits. It's just you know, it's like literally the same price, maybe a tiny bit more than you get in a suit at the fucking store. But this one, like, I think it takes like thirty two measurements. It's like literally made custom for you. Tailored. Yeah, exactly. Tailor. You pick the fabrics, the colors, the buttons, everything. It's done like with perfection. Plus, like, their customer supports on like they come to you. Yeah. I don't even gotta leave the fucking office. They go to my <laughs> office, measure me, they take care of it. It's there, they measure if there's any tailor work that needs done, they do it. It's fucking phenomenal, it's my favorite. Yeah, I'm I, I, I don't wear suits that much. I have like a suit at the crib. You gotta have one. I got, I got to, I got, I got to, I got to grow up. You want it, you want it, it's crazy? I'm gonna wearing watches and wear suits. And so suits. their shit is so sick, they actually put, they embroidered a tweak logo on the inside of my suits. I'll actually show you. The end, yeah, and like, even their line, they can put like, any like any image or any logo like that's fucking badass. Dude. Like you imagine you got like you're setting a that's statement. Yeah. Like, you know, like, Where'd you get that suit at? Oh, it's yeah. one one. Yeah. It's, Can't uh, get this anywhere. Yeah. Exactly. If I got this over here today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm gonna tell you, it's 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 fire. I mean, the dude, the dude. I watched that guy grow. You know what I mean? And I respect his fucking hustle. Cause like if you ever hear his story, the dude had no fucking money when he started his company. Dude, like, it was right. negative eighty seven dollars in his bank. Like literally, he had, like has a tattoo of it. Huh. But ask me how I know this shit. But like I love shit. Like you have a suit from him. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I know, but, like, those stories, like, as a business person... You love to hear it. I love to fucking hear it. And now, dude, the fucking empire. I mean, his customers are John Cena, the WWE, the NFL, like, actually, the rest of the WWE, the NFL. Yeah, I mean, the dude's a fucking beast. So, I mean, like, respect. Like, literally fucking major respect. Mm. Uh, shoe game. Jordans. Favorite, uh, to DJ in, too? Um, I mean... Because standing there for a while and jumping around... Actually, I, so my favorite shoe on earth is a Jordan 1. So I actually, right now, I think mm. I have like 52 different colorways on one side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm obsessed with Jordan 1, so I'll wear those a lot. Suede or the glossy look? Uh, no, I don't like the glossy look, actually. I don't um, like the glossy look. Yeah, I don't like that. Look like plastic. Like yeah, exactly. I just, like, it's for me, so uh, they just look cheap. I just, I'm not into it. So I do, I do just the regular general leather ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, dress shoe game, my favorite, and they're actually super fucking comfortable is either... The Salvatore Ferragamos are actually red bottoms, man. And red really? bottoms, oh fuck yeah, they're comfy as shit. Hmm. Yeah. Favorite designer brand? Uh-huh. High end designer brand, because I guess you could say anything's a designer brand. I think from anything like I really like wearing, I think Givenchy. Hmm. Givenchy's like my fucking. Why? Favorite. Just simple. I don't like like shit to be a boo. Like uh, like I like I like all brands. Like, I'm not gonna tell you I wouldn't wear other brands, but yeah. like generally with Givenchy, it's like just so relax, you know. Like sweatshirt with just the word Givenchy on it and white. It's just plain. It's simple. It's not too loud. I just, you know, it's nice and it feels great. Mm-hmm. Getting to the end of the interview, uh, I appreciate you pulling up. Oh, yeah, uh, right. I'm loving the dialogue in this conversation. I'm definitely learning a lot here. Can't wait to rewatch this as I edit it like three or four times. <laughs> uh, so before we get out of here, what is an untold truth about you? Untold truth. That's what I'm 
It could be a wow factor. I mean, it's not even like you know. What I mean, we we kind of covered so much in the interview. Cause, like, I'm told truth. Like, I mean, like I own a company. A lot of people don't know. Like I said, like even like my cut, my clients would never guess I'm a DJ. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of really cool. But like, I'll tell you one of the biggest things is like everyone knows. I come off as a little bit, uh, like, I'm, I'm extremely humble, but I come off as an asshole because I'm the type of person who doesn't tolerate stupidity or bullshit. Like, I just don't want it around. You have a, you have a certain standard that you live by. And exactly. You and I'm vocal. You. I'm vocal. Yeah. Like, I'm never going to let somebody bother me. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, I'm not going to go fight him and beat his ass, but if somebody did something that rubbed me the wrong way, I'd be like, yo, man, you got to knock that shit out. I don't like it. And sometimes, in this generation, people are so fucking entitled that they feel when you tell them that shit, you come off as an asshole. And no, sensitive. Man. Yeah, exactly. I'm not, I'm a nice guy. Like, if somebody needed my help or needed anything, I would do fucking anything for anybody. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. But at the same time, I just, you know, don't tolerate stupidity. So an untold truth about me is I'm actually, like, a really fucking nice guy. <laughs> no, seriously, like, a lot of people that know me, a lot of people that hang out with me, you know, right. like, like, holy fuck, dude, like, you come off as a fucking asshole. Yeah. But you're actually, like, a very nice fucking guy, you know what I mean? Like a lot of, like even girls I talk to sometimes or whatnot, they're like, dude, like when we first met you, we just thought you were such a fucking asshole, but like you're actually extremely nice. So I didn't think, like, 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 like when I first started seeing you, I didn't think you were an asshole, but like I remember we were in Cosmo, not Cosmo, Foxtail, and I, I, I had like a jacket in my hand, like, yo, could you put this up there? Like, mm -mm. You just kept DJing. I'm like, all right, well, fuck. <laughs> well, I mean, dude, <laughs> I'm like, come back for okay, it. Okay, so look, there's Jackson. Yeah, but that's the problem. But, okay. but, that's the problem. I would, see come you, back I, for it. I would see you outside, um, you know, just like talking shit with Oz and all that. Not only see like the flyers and just hear shit in the street. Mm -hmm. So those little separate interactions and the same with, it goes for y'all watching with other people that you may meet, it'll develop what mental rapport you have with that person. Absolutely. Right? So I'm thinking, okay, maybe he might just be like the typical DJ, not necessarily feeling himself, but if he is, I mean, he's killing it. He has a right to. Yeah. So it's something that, I mean, I don't, I don't feel anybody has a right to. Like, like I said, no, but I, you could, I, when I say feeling yourself, yeah. not I'm better than these people, I'm shitting on these people, I'm above them, but feeling yourself, you're allowed to, I'm not gonna say, I mean, you could do whatever the fuck you wanna do, but yeah. I'm saying you're, you're allowed to, like, like how you sit, yeah. you're wearing a bright lamp. How you could walk around and be comfortable and let's say subtly flashy to some people and to some people it's just regular because they don't know what the fuck like high end fashion and stuff is. Facts. You know what I mean? So you being able to uh, do that and people not being familiar with that realm of reality, they might think this dude's an asshole. Exactly. But I mean like, you know, but, just to touch up on it because I actually have that issue right now lots of time, so it's jacket time. Yeah. The problem is, okay, I'm a quick mixer. I don't like being disrupted. I don't like people who be in my booth. I love my craft. I like to be focused. Mm -hmm. You give me your jacket, it's nothing for me to toss it underneath. Right. But if I do it for you, I got to do it for 20 other people. Mm -hmm. And these 20 other fucking people leave at random fucking times. They come up there and they want their fucking jacket. Mm -hmm. I don't got time to go digging through the fucking lost and found of 20 jackets <laughs> to find where the fucking jacket is. Right, right, right. And right, it's right. not me being an asshole. It's like me, I got to fucking stay focused. Like, yeah. you know, sometimes I'll get people in my booth and they're just... Like, I don't like people in my booth because people start talking. Like, it's, it's, not, it's not an issue. I mean, I don't even, yeah, spill drinks, whatever. I mean, I, nah, obviously I don't want that shit either. But I'm mm -hmm. just saying, like, that's my, that's my you know, like, my boys, sometimes they get mad at me. They're like, dude, like, I literally put up chains at Fox, though, because I don't like nobody in my yeah. booth. <laughs> well, yeah, part of the fucking reason, like, on New Year's Eve, I decided to be nice and open them. It's like, I'm DJing, this dude's like, yo, man, it's almost his equipment cost. Yo, man, it's like, how'd you start? It's like, get the fuck out of here, bro. I'm working. Like, leave mm -hmm. the fuck alone. Like, not, that's not me being an asshole. Like, that's, that's the shit that makes me seem like I'm an asshole. It's like I'm fucking like I don't come bother you at work. You know what I mean? Like I don't yeah. want to carry a conversation while yeah. I'm DJing, especially because I quick picks. If I was doing like long yeah. four minute songs, I got four minutes in between. I'll bullshit with you all day long. Yeah. And a lot of people tell you like, see me on the fucking street, have a conversation with me, or see me out. I'll talk to you all fucking day. I love yeah. it. I love meeting people. You know, I love talking to people. If somebody came up to me and was like, yo, dude, like I'm trying to get into DJing, how can I do? It? I'll take you under my wing. Fuck yeah. I mean like. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna lie. A lot of people help me growing up, like understand like the different things when it comes to DJing and whatnot. So, but at the same time, there's like a time and place for everything. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's the that's the problem. People are like, "Oh, he's cocky. He thinks he's, I'm not cocky. I don't think I'm the shit." Just like, don't talk to me while I'm working. Let me hit me up. Like, if you hit me up on fucking Instagram. I was like, I need your help. So I got you. What do you need? I'll send you everything. Like, I'm not I'm not above anybody. I just don't want to do it while I'm working. Mm. And so, when it comes to uh separating your business businesses uh what can, what's some advice you could give to somebody who might have something going on over here and something going on over here and keeping those things separate so people people may not know and 
I mean, I mean, I do that on purpose. I mean, uh, so one of the biggest things is don't lose sight of what's most important. Like for me, if I have to quit DJing today, I'll quit DJing today as long as my company doesn't suffer. You know what I'm saying? Because my company comes first to me. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That's why I took five years off. I wanted to build and get to a place. I got it to a place where I can work, I can run it, but I'm no longer working 18 hours a day. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Now I can work the normal eight hours and oversee. I'll never hand like control to somebody else and not be able to be in control. Cause it's my it's my product. I built. That. I want to make sure it stays the best fucking product ever. So I, I like to oversee it. But at the same fucking time, if you got two things going on, you gotta give something a hundred percent at one point in order to get it to the right stage before you can focus on something. Because if you cannot give a hundred percent to two different things, it's gonna be fifteen mm -hmm. fifty, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I gave my company a hundred percent. Now I come out. On the weekends I DJ and I do so now I can give that a hundred percent because I've already established the one thing. And one of my main things why I separate the fucking businesses is because you know, car dealership, older people. You know what I mean? They might not understand like, oh, I'm gonna go with a company that CEOs out clubbing every weekend, like doing this stuff. They don't understand like actually DJing for me is a passion. I'm not out there like getting drunk or doing anything. I don't even fucking drink. I just wanna have a good time. You know what I mean? It's my passion, I wanna play good music. So I just kind of keep it separate for that specific reason. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, if you do it, just like I said, you got to give something 100% for a period of time. Otherwise, you're never, I mean, I don't want to say you're never going to make it because that just sounds like it's condescending, but you're going to be able to get to to your goals mm -hmm. much quicker. And just set fucking goals that are actually attainable. Like, the, a lot of people set goals that are just so unrealistic. Like, you can set a further goal, but set one goal first, mm -hmm. meet that one, and go to the next one, even though your end goal may be something insane. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to get from zero to 100 overnight. You know what I mean? You're going to yeah. need to go to one, to two, to three, and every fucking step. So build those fucking steps to get there. Well, uh, we appreciate you pulling up and yeah, telling man, us your story. Appreciate you having me here. Uh, oh, yeah. Appreciate all the insight. Uh, I'm glad you were looking forward to this and excited. I had a great conversation. <laughs> Definitely yeah. learned a lot. And I'm excited for what the people are going to say and what their takeaways are going to be. Can't wait to see it. Yeah. So uh, before we get out of here, where can the people follow you and tune in? How can they book you? Um, just basically, I mean, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, mostly uh, active on Instagram. I always tell people to follow me on Instagram. My, my text tweak official. Um, you know, hit me up if you got any questions, you know, you got any concerns, you know. And I'm, I'm friendly, you know. Mm -hmm. People can have a conversation <laughs> with me. I love that shit. He's so a nice like, guy. Yeah, I mean, no, I, mean I, I reply to everybody. I never leave somebody on red. So if somebody yeah. wants to talk, you know, chit chat, need some advice, need anything, I got you. I love that stuff. You know, if anybody listening too, like they ever need business advice or they need an internship or a mentorship, like I do a lot of that stuff too on the side. So if anybody <laughs> wants, you know, you know, just just to help, you know, especially the young youth. If the young youth, you know, you want to build a business or you want something, you're kind of like not sure how to go about it. You know, I'll gladly help you. Pro bono, never gonna charge anybody. But I've had people take me under their wing and teach me throughout my growth period. So I just want to get back. Well, ladies and gentlemen, DJ Tweak. Oh man, appreciate you having me here. Appreciate you pulling up.